stark warnings and secret documents. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. President Biden sharpens his attacks on former President Trump and Republican election deniers. America is big enough for all of us to succeed. And that is the nation we're building, the nation where no one is left behind. And hits the campaign trail to rally voters. It's open borders. It's 40-year high inflation. It's record gas prices, rising crime. So they're fundamentally destroying this country. But the GOP punches back. Plus, the Justice Department reveals new details about its investigation into classified documents seized from Trump's home. And a federal judge considers his request for a third party to review the files. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. With just two months to go until the midterms, President Biden is stepping up his attacks on the GOP. In a fiery speech Thursday, he blasted Republicans who are allied with former President Trump and embracing election lies. Outside Philadelphia's historic Independence Hall, where our nation was founded, Biden called those Republicans an extreme threat to the foundations of our nation, and he vowed to fight back. Democracy cannot survive when one side believes there are only two outcomes to an election. Either they win or they were cheated. And that's where the MAGA Republicans are today. The speech marked his second visit to the state in, the, in this week and in critical state of Pennsylvania, of course. On Tuesday, in a speech in the northeast part of Pennsylvania, Biden said Democrats are committed to supporting law enforcement and preventing police brutality. You got to know and you got to be able to trust the police. The police have to be able to trust the community. But we slipped away from that. We have a hell of a lot fewer cops today than we did when I wrote that initial crime bill. But now we got to get back to it. Meanwhile, this weekend, former President Trump will also be heading to the Keystone State to rally voters again. And just outside Biden's hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy pointedly criticized the president. Washington and the White House aren't listening. They just don't get it. His policies have severely wounded America's soul, diminished America's spirit, and betrayed America's trust. So a lot going on in Pennsylvania this week. Joining me to discuss this and more, Jonathan Martin, senior political correspondent for The New York Times and co-author of the book, This Will Not Pass, Trump, Biden, and the Battle for America's Future. Evan Perez, CNN senior justice correspondent, and joining me here in studio, Yasmin Abu Talib, White House reporter for The Washington Post, and Laura Barone Lopez, White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Thank you all for being here, Yasmin. First, congratulations on the new title and promotion to White House reporter, though I will be calling you if there is a COVID surge, just so you know. Always here. <laughs> Always there. Um, so, of course, we saw this, this primetime speech from President Biden where he called out in a rare way President Trump by name and Republicans. What's behind the strategy there? And does the White House think that this speech is really going to make a big difference? I think the White House viewed this speech as almost a kind of launch uh, ahead of the traditional kind of campaign season that'll start this weekend with Labor Day weekend and then really begin in earnest after that. Um, and I think they do think this is an effective strategy that Biden is trying to draw this distinction between MAGA Republicans, those who are loyal to President Trump and still say the 2020 election was rigged and have said that they might be willing to challenge future election results and those that he called mainstream Republicans who don't necessarily adhere to that political ideology. 
strategy. But I think they feel, you know, democracy is at stake. Democrats have been clamoring for this for a while, for the president to be much more forceful and direct and calling out the forces that they feel are a threat to the American way of governance. And so I think actually Democrats are pretty energized by this much more forceful President Biden. And Laura, I mean, as Yasmin just said, Democrats were really, really wanting to see sort of a more pointed attack from President Biden. And he said in his speech, there is no place for political violence in America. So what's your reporting reveal about sort of his the impact that the White House thinks this speech can have in their thinking? Biden really, this goes back for him to when he launched his campaign. You know, he responded to the violence that he saw at, in Charlottesville when the neo-Nazis were marching. And he said that he was launching his campaign because he felt that he needed to respond to that. And, and that's where his Soul of the Nation uh, slogan came from. But since then, uh, he has given a few speeches about the threats to democracy, but this was really a shift uh, this week. We saw that he started using the term at least once, calling uh, the forces that he's seen rise within the Republican Party semi-fascist. He did that in a Maryland at a Maryland fundraiser. And then again at the speech on gun violence, he talked about how you can't be pro-cop but also be saying that the FBI should be defunded. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, just later on this week, talking about the fact that what the political violence that he sees some Republicans encouraging is something that he felt the need to draw a line in the sand on. Uh, he very forcefully focused on former President Trump and a number of other Republicans, trying to say that he doesn't think all Republicans are this way, but that they are dominating the party. And ultimately, he felt as though he needed to address it. And he's talked to historians about yeah. this in recent weeks as well. Um, and Jonathan, when you talk about a line in the sand and what Laura is talking about, um, something that struck out to me in the speech also was President Biden saying, quote, um, Republicans spread fear and lies told for profit or in power, basically saying that there's a motivation behind why we're seeing these election lies. What are you hearing from your from your sources about the strategy here? Look, President Biden, you may had wanted to tee up the midterms with a sort of, uh, you know, political speech like this for a while that they thought about doing it earlier in the summer. And then I think as we've gotten closer to the fall, they realized that they had to go harder on this democracy angle, in part because that's what really animates Biden, and in part because of the facts on the ground, the nature of the people who are getting the nomination in the Republican Party uh, are, you know, pretty extreme. There's plenty of election deniers uh, out there. But they also made a choice here, which is to conflate uh, you know, a more traditional midterm political speech with a more high-minded speech uh, on the importance of protecting America's democracy and institutions and doing so from Independence Hall with sort of Marines standing behind him. And I think because he did both of those things uh, in the same speech, it drew some criticism uh, from obviously folks uh, on the right, but also some less predictable uh, uh, folks like the Washington Post editorial page, for example, sort of tut tutting Biden for for mixing high-minded appeals to small-D democracy and more traditional campaign season attacks on the GOP. I'll just say one more thing, Yamish, and that is I'm not totally sure why Biden had to insert himself into the conversation. There's an old saying, don't get in your opponent's way uh, when he's losing. I think a lot of Democrats have liked the way things are going the last couple of weeks because the attention has been entirely on Trump rather than on Biden. And when, when the focus is on Trump, uh, that tends to be good for Democrats. And I think there's some uncertainty as to why Biden wanted to bring it back to himself here instead of letting Trump keep doing his thing. If I could just add, I mean, in the meetings that Biden had recently with historians, he asked them if there was any similar moment in history that they could think of. Uh, that, And they said to him, 1940s, 1941, when President FDR then addressed fascism and potential rising forces of fascism within the U.S. And so I think that he's been very much thinking about that. Yeah. They said that that's been on his mind and that they also agree a lot of these historians pose to him without giving him direct advice on how he should write the speech, yeah. that uh, at a moment like this, a number of presidents in the past have weighed in to decide that 
this moment calls for that because of the forces at work in the country. And Evan, I know you're, you're the Justice Department. Obviously, you're you're reporting on the actual things that are going on in terms of keeping people safe in this country. And I want to point out that this week we saw the longest sentence handed out in a case stemming from the January 6th um, Capitol attack. We saw a man named Thomas Webster sentenced to 10 years. He's a former NYPD officer. I bring him up because I wonder what you make of that sentence and the idea that sort of the DOJ is at the heart of prosecuting people. Um, how does sort of these themes that we're talking about square with the violence and the threats that are that are real around this country? No, exactly. And I, look, I think with the, the, the conversation you guys have been having is really fascinating, especially within the context of what you see prosecutors and what the FBI are doing. And, you know, they're trying to their best to stay out of the political sphere. But it's really, it's impossible, right, when you are talking about people who committed violence in the name of the former president um, and, and who he has in the last, just in the last few days said that if he were to become president again, he's going to give pardons and that he is financially supporting some of them, uh, although that is not exactly quite clear because if you talk to, to people involved with some of the defendants, you know, they're quite angry because they believe that they've been hung out to dry while, while the former president has been raising millions and millions of dollars and hasn't really shared any of that to, to, to help uh, the defense of some of these people. But from a Justice Department standpoint, you know, I think they wanted to make sure that they made examples of some of the worst violent offenders, and, and that one gentleman is, is one of the, the people. I mean, he was attacking police uh, with uh, the weapons, and, and you have it on video. So they wanted to make a, an example of that. But there is some nervousness, I will say, about having, you know, the president and others in the Democratic Party try to sort of conflate some of the things that are happening. You know, they're trying to, you know, make sure people uh, go to jail who committed crimes uh, and not conflate that with the broader picture of uh, the political fight that is going on over democracy, small d or big D, uh, because, you know, that is, those are two things that can't be mixed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an interesting and an important point. Yasmin, when we think about sort of conflations and, and sort of the midterm strategy and the language being used, I also want to point out that President Biden spent some time talking about crime and policing and law enforcement. And part of that, he talked about the sort of crime bill um, and wanting to make sure that there are more police officers and hiring more, hiring more police officers. On the flip side, there are people, including civil rights leaders that he met with today, who are worried about sort of this midterm strategy of being tough on crime. What are you hearing, both from the White House, but also people who are worried about what that could mean for people in mass incarceration? I think this is a really difficult area for Biden and for, for Democrats more broadly, especially those who are in these difficult swing states. He did deliver that speech on crime in Pennsylvania, where, of course, the, the Democratic Senate candidate, John Fetterman, is all, this is a top issue in his race, is uh, his record on crime and, and whether he's going to be tough on crime or not. And so I, I thought that speech was interesting because you saw the president taking this pretty markedly pro-law enforcement stands, almost wanting to draw a very sharp distinction between him and Democrats who a year or two earlier were talking about defunding the police and, and you know, some of the problems with police force in the U.S. Uh, but I think, you know, there is the risk that he alienates some of the, the people in his party, particularly those on the left and those who have expressed uh, concerns about criminal justice and, and the inequities and, and who's incarcerated um, if, if he swings too far in either direction. So I think this is just a, a very difficult balancing act for him and for, for many Democrats. Democrats in these tough races. And John, J. Mart, I just want to say we call you Jonathan Martin, whatever. Everyone who knows you calls you J. Mart. So J. Mart, uh, Yasmin's talking about Pennsylvania. Let's go there. President Biden's going to have been there three times just this week. Of yeah. course, President, former President Trump is also heading there. Why are they all heading to Pennsylvania? Make this make <laughs> sense for us. Why is it so significant to them? Well, I don't think it's because they're all, you know, looking to get a, uh, a taste of yingling uh, for Labor Day weekend, <laughs> uh, although uh, a few of those could be consumed uh, uh, as well. Look, I, it's probably the most important battleground state uh, this year because you've got these marquee uh, races for the Senate and for governor. And the Senate race there, Yamish, it's really the best opportunity Democrats have to flip a Republican-held seat. Pat Toomey is retiring. That seat's open. It's a state, obviously, that has gone to the Democrats, um, you know, 
with the exception of in, in 2016, when Trump carried it, uh, for the last few cycles for Democrats. And so I think it's an opportunity uh, to get a rare pickup uh, in the Senate. Uh, and if Dems hold their majority in the Senate, it'll be in part because they, they flip that seat. Uh, and I think as important, image, it's because this governor's race is so central, not just in 2022, but in 2024. And the reason for that is because Pennsylvania invests extraordinary power in their governor when it comes to the administration of elections. The governor essentially in Pennsylvania is the chief elections officer. And, web, and that is so important because in 2024, the governor there is going to have enormous authority when it comes to certifying the results of the election. And I don't have to tell the viewers of this show uh, why certification of that election is so important. Yeah. Um, and when you think when we're talking about the election and sort of what's at stake, Laura, the, our friends at the Cook Political Report, they shifted its forecast from five competitive House races in favor of Democrats, meaning, meaning Democrats are in a better place. What are you hearing from how Democrats and Republicans are feeling about their chances in the midterm, given the fact that the House, at least for me, when I talk to Republicans, they still feel good about winning the House, but not as good as they did maybe two months ago? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, a few months ago, Republicans thought they would have had a big wave in the House, and now it's really, uh, they, they may only pay pick up a few seats. I think they still are favored, but Democrats are feeling bullish, especially about keeping the Senate. And they're feeling bullish because of the fact that all of these, whether they're special election races or um, primary races, the way that they've gone, Democrats see it as favorable to them because of the fact that abortion is starting to play big in a lot of these races, abortion rights. What we saw in Alaska this week, yes, that did have to do with ranked choice voting, with the Democrat uh, winning there, uh, Mary Peltola, and beating out Sarah Palin, the Republican. But a lot of uh, a Democratic data firm ha has been saying, actually, that registration changed after yeah. the Roe decision, after uh, Roe was overturned, a number of women started registering at greater numbers. It went up about seven points. And that's happened in other states across the country, including Wisconsin and Michigan, where you've seen uh, women register in greater numbers since the decision, as well as younger women. Yeah, it's going to be a big, big topic. Um, another big topic that probably is on a lot of people's minds as we enter the sort of official kickoff of the midterms is that we learned more about former President Trump's legal challenges in the Justice Department's investigation. On Tuesday, the DOJ revealed this photo showing classified documents found at Trump's home during the FBI search last month. It shows five yellow folders marked top secret and another red folder labeled secret. The photo was part of a filing by the Justice Department. The DOJ also said it believes top secret documents had likely been, quote, concealed and removed from the storage room to obstruct the government's investigation. And on Friday, the DOJ released a detailed list of what was seized from Trump's home. A judge is also considering Trump's request for the appointment of a special master to review the file seized. So, Evan, clearly we're coming to you for this. There are so many developments. Tell us what is most important and what happened, what's most significant about this week. Well, look, I think you guys, you know, I've been talking a little bit about the troubles for Republicans, and this is exactly the kind of thing that it, where Donald Trump is not helping uh, Republicans because, you know, the former president, or himself, by the way, the, pro the former president decided to, to, to make these legal, uh, the, this legal move to, to, you know, after nearly three weeks to ask for a special master. So what that did is that prompted the Justice Department to release a lot of information that otherwise they would never have because Merrick Garland doesn't believe in in telling us very much unless he speaks through court documents. And, and so some of the things you just listed were just, there was a deluge of information about, you know, for example, just today, you know, we saw that commingled with magazines and, and other personal do, uh, uh, things like, like clothing, you know, there were dozens and there were, I'm sorry, there was 11,000, more than 11,000 uh, government documents that were found as part of the search. There were uh, four dozen uh, empty folders that were labeled as classified. What was in them? We don't know. We also know that there were like seven, there were about seven boxes of documents that were taken from the former president's office. Now, keep in mind, uh, you know, back in June, the FBI and the Justice Department told the Trump team that they were to secure everything that was classified information in a storage room. And yet, when they showed up in August, they found all of these documents, including classified top secret stuff, in his office, which really means that, you know, brings it closer to him. So, look, the, the, the bottom line here is that 
there is real legal jeopardy for the former president. There is real legal jeopardy for people around him who are handling some of this stuff and who swore that you know, they had turned over everything. And the worst part of, for, for, for Republicans is all of this is coming out and it's going to keep coming out because of the, pres the former president's legal maneuvers in this Florida court, which means we're going to keep getting reminded about this between now and the, uh, and the midterms, most likely. And you're talking about people close to President Trump having legal jeopardy, Evan. Um, legal specialists say two lawyers for former President Trump, they might either become targets or witnesses of, of this investigation. What's your reporting on that? No, that's right. Exactly. And we saw one of those lawyers actually show up in court. And, and a lot of us were kind of astonished because at one point, at some point, you become a fact witness and potentially someone who could get hauled before the grand jury. And most lawyers know that once you get to that stage, then you need to pull away from the, from the, from the, uh, the legal case of your client. So we'll see whether that happens. The former president has brought in some real legal uh, help. You know, Chris Kyes is a, is a former Solicitor General of Florida. He's now representing the former president. A and so now, you know, we now believe that, you know, certainly the person who, one of the lawyers who signed the declaration, Christina Bob, uh, Evan Corcoran, these are people who are potentially witnesses in this criminal investigation that the Justice Department says is still really just at the beginning. And, Jamar, we have Attorney General Bill Barr that just today saying um, that there's, it was unprecedented for the president to take these classified documents and put them in a country club. You have that, just oppose that with Lindsey Graham saying that there's going to be riots in the streets if he's prosecuted. Tell me about the Republican response and what's going on here. Yeah, look, I think when the uh, feds raided uh, Mar-a-Lago, I think there was an initial uh, circling of the wagons. Uh, th this is uh, unprecedented. Uh, th this is a really extreme step. Uh, you know, we need more facts. Well, I think in the weeks since then, we have gotten more facts, and we've gotten them mostly through these court filings. Um, uh, some of them precipitated, uh, in fact, by the Trump legal team, uh, uh, which has, you know, uh, effectively invited some of these filings uh, that, that have, in fact, shed more light uh, on the allegations that, that the former president did, in fact, bring uh, top secret material, including some human intelligence, uh, you know, spycraft uh, with him to his residence uh, in South Florida, which, you know, it's pretty easily accessible if you're a member or a guest there. And I think you've seen you meet Republicans, at least the more prudent ones, grow notably more quiet, at least yeah. about the facts here, because they don't want to get too far out there not knowing precisely what Trump had in those documents. So I think you have seen uh, a shift. Um, and look, I think uh, some of those who are close to Trump are never going to abandon him. But I think that there's a sort of broader faction of the party that is not going to want to be linked to him if he is found, if he's indicted, and then certainly if he's found guilty of, you know, violating the Espionage Act or yeah. obstruction of justice. All things that are really, really possible. sort of very, very serious allegations. Evan, I want to come to you. We have a couple minutes, and I want to try to get to these ladies at the table, but I have to ask you one other thing, which is what's the significance of this special master and the judge considering it? Well, the judge, uh, who um, her name is Aileen, Aileen Connor, she's a, a Trump appointee in, in, in West Palm Beach. Uh, and, you know, it, it was quite surprising that just based on the filing from the former president, she decided to rule last, uh, last Saturday that she was inclined to, to appoint a special master. This is like a third party lawyer, typically a former judge maybe, that would basically come in and look at all of the documents and decide whether there was any attorney-client privilege material that needed to be put aside. Now, the, the issue for the Trump team and for all of this is that, you know, the FBI has been doing this for like nearly yeah. three weeks, as something Bill Barr pointed out. So the significance here is that this could potentially delay this, this investigation, which of course we know is part of the strategy from, from Donald Trump that, you know, goes back years. So yeah. we'll see whether that she grants it. We're still waiting at this hour to see whether she grants it. We'll definitely be watching that. And I'll come to, to Laura. You've been covering former President Trump. What do you make of this sort of the, the, the PR of this and the arguments that he's making against it? Well, one thing that really uh, I'm struck by is the fact that we don't know the full breach 
right? We don't know. Um, the, the director of national intelligence is conducting a damage assessment. But yeah. how many people had their hands on this? How many people went through there? Um, the fact that classified information was commingled with non-classified, you talk to any intel official and that's a no-no right off the bat yeah. because that means that someone who's reaching for non-classified information automatically then touches something that's classified and that's now yeah. compromised. 10 seconds. Uh, yes, I mean, you obviously know very deeply how President Trump functions. What do you make of the way that he's handling this? I think it's pretty typical in trying to blame everyone else, going back to saying he should be reinstated as president. I think it's it's all kind of predictable, but it does his his reaction does seem like he is seriously concerned about what kind of trouble he might end up in. And this is all stuff that we're going to have to continue to watch as former President Trump is saying this is a smash and grab, and the Justice Department is saying this is a very serious and fair way that they went about doing this. So thank you all of you for Jonathan, Evan, Yasmin, and Laura for joining us and for sharing your reporting on this holiday weekend. And before we go, so don't forget to watch PBS News Weekend for the latest on the DOJ's investigation of former President Trump and the reaction to President Biden's speech denouncing Trump and other GOP election deniers. There's no Washington Week extra tonight, so enjoy your holiday weekend. I'm Yamish Alcindor. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.